Well, today is kind of a big day for Maine Maritime Academy. This is when the training ship comes back from a 60-day voyage. Uh, their last port of call before coming in today was Eastport. Uh, they got underway uh, yesterday and arrived at pilot station at 0300. Uh, the pilot is Captain Dave Jelinas, who's a Maine Maritime grad. And he always likes doing this job because it's, um, it's kind of filled with fanfare. These students have been out at sea for 60 days and they're all pretty anxious to get home and see their moms and dads and girlfriends. So today what happens, uh, this is a little special event that they do. The training ship will come up the bay just as uh, all of our other traffic does, our tankers and bulkers, uh, and it'll go into Mack Point to the dock in Searsport where uh, all of the parents of the seniors are invited to go for a cruise. So they uh, will meet the ship out here at 0600 uh, off of the II buoy, Islesboro Island buoy. And another tug will be assisting today. Normally, if it was a commercial ship, there'd be two of uh, Penobscot Bay Tractor Tug Company tugs. Uh, but today, there's just going to be one. This is the Fournier tractor we're on. It is uh, what I would consider the best available technology in the shipping industry. It is a tractor tug. It's azimuth and drive. It can get, it can do all kinds of tricks, which I'll show you later. Uh, the pilots really like this boat. The other tug will be coming out of Castine, and that's the training tug called the Pentagoet with uh, Captain Harry Stevens on board. And Harry and some crew, or we'll probably hear him on the radio here in just a second. They're getting underway from Castine. They're coming over to the II buoy. They'll meet up with the ship. We'll be starting to make arrangements with the pilot on how he wants to arrange the tugs. And then we'll work our way into the Searsport dock. And generally, they'll have the tractor up forward and they'll have the Pentagoet back aft, but things are always a little different, so we'll see. Then when they, we, basically the ship gets down to dead slow, we make the approach to the dock, and we very, very gently put it into the berth and hold in while they put out lines. And then, I'm not exactly sure what the arrangements were with parents, but generally what they do is they, they meet over in Castine, take a bus over to the Sprague Terminal, and come out and join the ship. So we'll be having a little lay time there while the ship is loading its passengers and guests. And then we'll get underway probably around 9 o'clock, sail them out. And then what the ship is going to do is go out for a little day trip with them. Uh, they're probably going to just stay in Belfast Bay, West Penobscot Bay. Uh, they give the folks some lunch and uh, there's lots of hugs and cameras and stories to be told. And then we will head over to Castine and meet them off the CH buoy at about 11.30 and the Pentagoet once again will be there with us and the pilot will direct the ship into the dock and then over there is all the rest of the parents, all of the freshmen's parents, uh, the president of the academy will be there, uh, President Bill Brennan, usually a, a pretty good size showing. If the weather is nice, uh, they usually have big banners out and uh, everybody is there. It's, pretty, it's a pretty exciting time. Six, 60 days is a pretty long time for somebody that maybe hasn't been away uh, that, that, that duration before. This year the cruise was uh, primarily set up on, uh, on this side of the Atlantic. They went to, to, I don't know all the ports, but they went to Tampa, I think they went to Puerto Rico, uh, I think they might have stopped at Bermuda. Uh, then they went all the way up around to Quebec, uh, Halifax I think was one of their ports of call, Eastport. And all of this is part of the training that the students go through. Uh, today on board this tug, I've got Ryan Shea, who's a Maine Maritime uh, graduate, almost a graduate, he'll be graduating this December. Um, he, and like a lot of other young people that really have an interest in uh, getting as much experience as they can, are going to school, but they work over here for uh, Captain Fournier on his tugs to get additional training and uh, make some money while they're in school. So it's kind of a nice symbiotic relationship we have with uh, Maine Maritime and uh, you know, the, the tractor tug company here. Um, my job today is captain on this tug. Uh, I'm just one of the fill-in captains for uh, Captain Fournier. Um, <clears throat> but I love getting out and doing this job. I love running this boat. It's probably one of the most uh, uh, maneuverable tugboats I've ever run in my life. And I'll say it is the most maneuverable tugboat I've ever run in my life. Um, it can really do some amazing um, uh, quick turns, uh, it can stay in position, and that's why the pilots really like this tug. Uh, when I had owned the tugboat company, you know, back in the, in the 90s and 80s, we, we would have uh, drooled to have a boat that could do all that this boat could do. Uh, 
Um, and it, and it, it's really neat too because it really improves port safety. So one of the reasons I was really kind of excited to have the local uh, Belfast cable channel come out is to show you what we do on a regular basis out here, what the port does. Uh, and this is, this is kind of a nice little fun trip that we do, but we, we do this same type of work 24-7, 365 days a year. A lot of people see the tugs tied up, and, and this, is a, this is a port which is a, kind of a niche port. It provides a lot of cargo to the mid coast mid, uh, of Maine, uh, and it's not a busy, busy port like uh, Portland or New York. So the tugs seem like they don't go anywhere, but one of my favorite stories is one time I came down to the waterfront and uh, went out and did it, started a job about like we did this morning. I got underway at 0200. I docked a ship in Searsport, sailed a ship in Searsport, ran up to Bucksport, and got back uh, probably around 8 a.m. And I'm walking off the tug and I see a couple of nice folks there. And it was a local Belfast person that was showing the tugs. And they said, these are our tugboats. They, they don't ever go anywhere. They, they're just here. And it was kind of humorous to me because I'd been up all night. Uh, but they, they like having Belfast as a place to, uh, to bring the tugs because it's a nice protected harbor, a uh, good place to uh, uh, you know, maintain them. We have a, Doug has a nice barge there which he can keep all of his spare parts on. But their primary work is over in Searsport at Mack Point and Bucksport. Occasionally go to Bangor, do work for Chinbro and Brewer. Um, Doug does occasional uh, coastwise towing. He recently actually got a really great contract with uh, uh, Ken Wayne, uh, Ken Priest. Uh, they're building fenders for nuclear submarines down in New London, and it's really neat. They're building them here in Maine. They're bringing them down to Front Street, who uh, Ken Priest is a partner, loading them on chartered barges, and then taking them down to New London. So it's an American product built in an American port, shipped on American bottoms for American use. It's pretty neat. The tugs do do a, a fair amount of work. We have, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are now, you know, 250, 300 ships a year, tugs and barges, um, and all of those require assists. And they're, the, the, when the tugs aren't being maintained or uh, being in shipyard, they usually hang out in Belfast and then they go out and do their work. So this job, in a lot of ways, is a little bit like uh, some of the commercial work that, uh, that we do, only it's a different type of vessel. Right now, if you look on the radar there, this is, uh, and I got to go to work here. Forney Tractor on 10. Good morning, Captain Jolinas. Good morning. Good morning, John. We're just, uh, we're just slowing down. We've got everybody set up for all 600, so I'm not going to be up there too much before that. I think I'll line up from you. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, we're, uh, we're puttering our way over to you now, and uh, I think I see uh, uh, the Pentagon on the radar there, so we'll, we'll be waiting for you when you get here. We'll have uh, area of the center lead aft, and we'll take you on the starboard side. Slowly crawl, crawl into the channel here and hope to see the dock. Sounds good, David. Uh, the, the visibility is a little murky out here, but it's been improving, and it's quite good in Belfast. That's the help. I think we're going to be fine, John. We'll just take it slow like always. Thank you. We'll be standing by here on 10 from now on. Standing by 10. So the next step now is to... Uh, um, wait to get the order to come alongside and get them in visibility. You can hear the ship now, hear the foghorn? Harry, I'm right here at the uh, port side of the ship on the quarter. Uh, where are you right now? I'm about uh, half a mile from you, John. You're just up on my bow. Okay, very good. I'm going to slide around and get up on his starboard side there and just pace along with him up by the bow. Roger that. I'll get you inside here in just a, just a little. Yeah, this is quite uh, an interesting way to run a boat. It took me a while to do this. I used to ride out with Captain Fournier, and then I actually went to a school in Canada to learn this type of drive. This is how you drive the boat. These basically are very similar to two 360-degree outboards back aft. So this is the angle. So if you were thinking of it as an outboard, this would be the tiller. So when I first get underway in the morning, I clutch them in against each other, and that's what they call transverse arrest. So it doesn't make me go ahead or astern. It just holds me in position. And then I lock them in. 
So they're, they're turning all the time, and I never take them out of gear like you would a conventional tug. So what I basically do is, right now I'm driving ahead. This one I've got right amidships, and this one I'm steering with. So if I want to go that direction, I take it like it would a tiller, and I pull it, push it away. So I'm turning it this way right now. So right now what we're doing is we've left Belfast Harbor. The visibility is reduced a little bit, so we're, we're on our, uh, our radar and our other navigational equipment. And we're going to look for the ship. The ship has some challenges. He doesn't want to approach the berth uh, if he can't see it. So what he'll do is he'll go very slow, get the tugs alongside so we can control him. And then as we get closer to the berth, um, he'll start getting some uh, readings from people that are on the dock, people that are on the tugs, people that are up on the bridge to get his visibility and bearing. He has on board his vessel his own GPS, the pilot, that he brings with him which is accurate even closer than a meter. It's uh, like a foot. Uh, and it is a system that they set up so that no matter what vessel they get on, they have complete confidence that they've got the, the very best uh, GPS system. And they've put their own chart program into there and actually had people come out and do it. So it keeps them right in the designated shipping lane within a, you know, within a foot of the location they want to be on. And that's really great for uh, you know, working with the uh, fishermen so that they know exactly where the ships are going to be, working with the yachts. This time of year we have a lot of yachts. So they're going to want to know uh, exactly, uh, you know, the, the, the yachts are going to want to know exactly where those ships are. They can go to the chart, go to the designated shipping lane, and know that that ship is going to be within a foot of, the, of its designated line, uh, which is pretty, pretty important. Another thing that's been added a lot uh, to vessels now is what they call AIS, it's an advanced uh, identification system. And what that does is it actually puts an electronic image of vessels on your chart. And that's what this device does up here. So this shows me where everybody is right now that's uh, in this local area. So my game plan right now is I, I want to get over, get near the ship, start to uh, uh, pace the ship a little bit and then find out where I'm going to lay. I've already gotten orders from the pilot. They want me to lay up on the starboard bow. So as we get a little closer, Ryan will go down on deck. I'll fire up the uh, winch, uh, which is on hydraulics. He will we'll land alongside the ship. He'll throw up a heaving line to the eager MMA cadets, and they'll pull the line on board. I'll adjust it, and then I'll just ride along with him without putting on any, any pressure on him until we get close to the berth. Uh, in the old days, uh, the pilots uh, would uh, give all their commands uh, to the tugs, and the, they would expect the tugs would answer them on their horn. So the pilot, they would all, we were working on the radios, VHF, uh, and that pilot would uh, give a command to the forward tug to push or pull or whatever he needed to keep the ship moving in the direction that he wanted to. But uh, these days, they've gone now to all VHF and answering them and talking to them and taking commands all on the radio. So you, that's why in the old days, you, if you were living over in Searsport, you probably used to hear a lot of horns uh, during the night uh, of, 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 the, of the tugboats giving commands. But now it's uh, uh, a little more silent. It's all done on the radio. Yep, just easy, easy. Easy push. So what he's doing now is he's working that stern tug towards Sears Island or so that it'll push the stern to starboard. And then he's got me just kind of stopping and holding so that as he makes the turn here, I'm in position to either push him or pull him. The tide is now ebbing, so the ship is going to tend to want to go towards the berth. So now he's just trying to keep it so that it's just going by that end without any uh, great speed ahead or sideways. Ned and I were talking a little bit about some of the apps that are available for people that are interested in maritime things in general, but in, por in ports uh, for sure. This is uh, one app that I really recommend to people that are interested in shipping. It's called Marine Traffic. I think it's like a $5 app. And what this will do, uh, there's a system called Automatic Information System that all commercial ships are required to have. And it puts out an image that can be picked up on charts. So if you, let's go right here. We'll zoom right out here. So this is Penobscot Bay right here. 
and you see these little icons, well, these are vessels that are out there. For example, if I touch this one, you'll see that this is the Fournier tractor that, that we're sitting on right now. And if you go to this, it'll tell you information about the tractor, uh, give you some pictures of it. Uh, takes a little, there's some pictures, and actually we're sitting right on it right now in this very, very place. It has uh, all different types of information about, let's see how I get rid of that. Uh, go back. There's some more t pictures of the tug. But this gives the, the information, and then when you go back to this, you'll see it right on the chart. So it's pretty handy because what it allows you to do is see all of the traffic, the commercial traffic on the bay. For example, today, um, I'm going to refresh it like this, and uh, you should start to see the ferries. There they are right there. There's one of them. Actually, it's a little early for them all to be running on a Sunday, but if you hit this icon right here, there's the Captain Charles Philbrook. It tells you where it's going, what, uh, and right now it's not moving. And then if you hit this and say, uh, show the track, it'll go back and it'll show you what its recent track is. Well, since it hasn't gotten underway this morning, it isn't moving. But let's go up here, we'll find a different one. Let's go to refresh. And I'll hit the, the tractor, which we're on right now. So if I go to this and I say, let me see the track of the tractor. Well, there, this is where I went today. I came out of Belfast, went and got alongside the state of Maine, and now we're right alongside the training ship state of Maine. It's a really great uh, app to show you what's going on, and more and more vessels are, are uh, having that. Another one that I use quite a bit uh, is one right here. It's called Marine Plus. If you hit Marine Plus, and I think this one is like 99 cents, so it's a pretty good value. Um, what this does is give you uh, localized weather, tides, uh, a lot of other information that's kind of helpful. So right now you see how it lit it up all pink for the Penobscot Bay Area, and if I hit the icon and it'll say forecast, this will give me all of the marine, uh, takes a little minute, where, here we go. This gives you the, uh, the forecast for this area uh, for the next few days, and it tells you winds, things that the, the mariners want to know. If you go and hit back, and then back to layers, whoop, you can see right here the things that are available. I can get live weather at all the buoys. I can get tide predictions. I can get sunrise, sunset. Uh, I can get current predictions, which if you're in the shipping world is pretty important. So for example, if I wanted to know what the tides were, whether this would be a good day to go for a walk around Sears Island, I would go to the tide predictions, hit back, it's going to take a minute for it to clear. And then all of a sudden, you'll see these little icons appear. And what those are, those are tide stations. So if I hit the tide icon in Belfast, hit the tide station, there it gives me the tides for the day. It's pretty slick. Uh, and it's also quite handy. It'll also give you current tides and so forth. Uh, Merchant Mariners are very lucky to have these phones now. Uh, they have some unbelievable uh, tools on here. For example, this one is a little charting program. If I hit this, this is right on my phone. So if I'm out of my small vessel, uh, a little you know, motorboat that doesn't have any navigation tools, I can hit this and in about two seconds what it's going to do is it's going to take satellite information to my phone and it's going to show me right where I am and it's going to take a minute for it to find it. And there you go. That's me. If you look at that, this is uh, Sears Island. Of course, it's foggy, you can't see it. But this shows you all the buoys. It shows you exactly where, where we are. And uh, this is the kind of technology that would have probably cost uh, six or $7,000 four or five years ago, is now available on my phone for 99 cents. Okay, tractor, gentle back, John, very gentle back. Easy back. Stop. Stop and hold. Yeah, I, um, I ran the tugboat company here in Belfast until 2003, and then I went over to, the, to uh, Maine Maritime and took a job over there on the waterfront uh, running uh, 
actually I was invited over to run one of their research vessels, and then that turned into running the schooner Bowden, which is part of their training program, making trips up to Canada and uh, Newfoundland. And like a lot of uh, things at May Maritime, when they find out things that you can do, you get tasked to do new things. So then I ended up teaching the tug and barge program and working on the Pentagoet. I uh, worked on the waterfront uh, until 2009, and then I moved up the hill to run the career service office. I did that for two years. Really liked doing that, but I, I really found out I wasn't an office person, and so I left there and took a year out working my license, and I worked uh, all types of things. I've been, uh, right now I'm uh, one of the relief captains for the Maine State Ferry Service. Uh, run the pilot boat for Wayne Hamilton occasionally, run these tugs occasionally, uh, run some passenger vessels. I ran Prudence a little bit last summer. So I'm basically a wheelhouse oriented person. That's where I'd really like to be and uh, whenever I get a chance to get on a vessel. So now I'm back at the academy working on the waterfront and uh, running all types of boats over there. The, the training boat, uh, Ned, which is their high-speed uh, navigational vessel, uh, Friendship, which is a research vessel, Pentagon, which is their training tug. Uh, I'll probably help a little on the boat when uh, Captain Jurgensen they need some time off. Um, and I'll, I'll be working throughout the fall, teaching some classes, running some boats, uh, doing kind of what I like to do. It's going to be fun. I started out as a deckhand on the schooners in Camden. Then I eventually bought a schooner with my wife and I and ran it out of Belfast for five years called the Sylvina Beale. Uh, then while I was doing that, I met the local tugboat owner at that time was uh, Arthur Fournier. And I started tugging with him in the winter. Kept moving up, got my license, started running tugs. Then in the, the late 80s, uh, uh, he got involved in running a company down in Portland and he offered to sell the tugboat company to myself and a partner, Duke Tomlin. So we ran it for, I, together we ran it for 14 years. Then uh, that was uh, when I decided to move on and try some other things. So I sold my interest out to, uh, to Duke and he ran it for a few more years. And I went over to the academy and you know, what I've just mentioned. And then uh, Duke sold it to back to Arthur Fournier and uh, his son set up to run it, uh, Doug Fournier, back in like 2005 or six, I think. And uh, now the company is very healthy. The boats are state of the art. Uh, the port is, is uh, I, I would say that it's, it's not booming. It's, it's definitely slowly increased its traffic over the years. And um, it's gotten to a point now where uh, they have, are able to maintain and keep some, uh, some equipment, which I think is really, really important to the port. It's very, uh, very, like I say, state of the art, it's, it's well designed. So basically my life has been on the water. I've been, I've run all types of schooners. I worked in, when I was in Camden, I ran uh, wind jammers out of there. I've run tugboats, I've run pilot boats, I've run, you know, all, all to crew boats. We had a crew boat for a while. We ran out and did uh, work with the pre-positioned ships and took duck hunters out and, uh, you know, whatever it takes to make a living in the state of Maine, working on the water. That's kind of what I focused on. It's been a pretty good way to, way to hang out. So basically what that is, that's the, uh, the wind turbine Volturnus. It's a, a consortium of sea wind putting it together. It's made out of uh, concrete and uh, composites. It's the only floating wind turbine in North America. And right now it's, it's, not, it's not turning because they're doing tests on it and they're improving uh, the way that it uh, responds to the, the, the power that's required to come from shore to control it. And also, they uh, they're having some issues with return voltage. So that it's been running and not running and running and not running. It's off right now. You can see the blades are feathered. And uh, when it uh, is fully operational, it will run power. And right there's a, a, a cable that runs from the thing right to shore up to the CMP, and it will produce enough power that it'll actually put a little bit of power back on the grid. Um, and then behind it is uh, the LRAD buoy, which is a research buoy to measure all the conditions of the weather and wind independently of the Volturnus. So it measures uh, temperature, sea conditions, wind. Uh, it has a device that measures wind up to 1,000 feet above it through uh, a laser. And it, uh, it's actually gathering some data that I didn't even know the other day. It gathers. Uh, uh, bat and bird information it has these like real high-tech mics on there that measure all the birds that go by 
and uh, it's totally self-dependent, the little buoy. The, the big buoy, I mean, the uh, wind turbine is, is uh, got little generators on it which tell the, the clutches and everything which way to, to aim, and it's all lit up. It's got cameras on it so they can see from shore if anybody tries to get on it. Uh, it's a pretty big project, and it's it's the first step on actually developing offshore wind. So that's one eighth scale. It's going to be uh, the conditions here are one eighth of what they think they would be off Monegan. So they're trying here, and they're going to got permission now to keep it there till uh, sometime uh, next spring. So it's a pretty neat project. So John, thanks so much for uh, letting us come aboard and see how you operate and talk. Well, I'm really glad you could come out net and I think it's a kind of a nice scratch your surface of what the port does 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, you know, making, uh, you know, bringing products up to the state of Maine. This is kind of a nice way to see it in a fun way with the training ship. But all of these students are being trained to, to uh, work commercial ships uh, on the marine highway. Come back again.